Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our third and uh, the last day of our Cooperative Councils Innovation Network conference. We've had an amazing uh, couple of days um, this week, looking at all sorts of issues uh, about how we build back greener. Uh, we've looked at jobs and, uh, and employment and business. We've looked at how we promote cooperative economies, and we had some great sessions on that yesterday. We've looked at how uh, what a magnificent job local government has done in tackling the COVID pandemic and how uh, the work that's been done at local level has really been uh, a shining star uh, compared to some of the inconsistencies and chaos that have happened uh, with some of the centralised uh, work. So I think local government has shown itself in a fantastic light um, during, during the pandemic and of course it's ongoing. We hear further announcements this morning of um, areas that have very high levels of COVID. And we're ever mindful that even if our area is not in that situation at the moment, it could be at any time. So we're vigilant, we're ready. We've had some fantastic launches this week of our uh, COVID-19 uh, case studies book, of our new case studies book for general uh, good practice. And there, there's a picture of it on the screen for you all. Um, and of our um, induction program that's been uh, worked on for us by the Cooperative College. So um, we've had uh, a really good uh, set of launches this week. And now uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, the founder, the person who invented the Cooperative Council's Innovation Network. He is our president. Um, he has been uh, an, an inspiration and a mentor to me for many years. And he is now uh, the Shadow Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government, Steve Reed, And Steve um, was uh, born just down the road from uh, where I, my, my council in Stephen, she was born in St Albans and grew up there. But um, he quickly, uh, after going to university, uh, he went to that London and uh, he's been uh, in London ever since. And of course, uh, Steve started the, this network when he was leader of Lambeth Council and he picked up uh, the leadership of Lam Lambeth Council when it had had uh, significant problems with a, a very low rated audit commission inspection and he took it to a three star rating in, uh, in very short order. Um, in, uh, uh, Steve was then elected to Parliament uh, with Jim McMahon, the other uh, founding father of the network. Um, and I'm still here in local government and very pleased to be so. So um, that's that's great for me. Uh, but um, I'm very pleased to see both Jim and Steve um, doing uh, the, the national work that we need to see for local government. Steve, um, you've already uh, made your voice very strongly heard as um, Shadow Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government. You're a great champion of localism. I've seen that in all the many years I've worked with you. So I'm going to uh, hand over to you now to give us your keynote address and uh, welcome it again and thank you for all your support over many years uh, for our network. Well, thank, I mean, thank you very much, uh, Sharon. I'm not sure I can live up to the, uh, the, the warmth of that very, very generous introduction. And it's, um, I mean, it is interesting to see me, me and Jim in Parliament now, uh, but with you, that was the, the, the trio that set this network up. Of course, you're the only one of us that's actually in power uh, at the moment. I hope we can change that at a national level uh, at the next general election. But in the meantime, I, I know all of us have been absolutely amazed at the quality of leadership that you and all of our other local government leaders have shown through this completely unprecedented panic and I you know f for my money a far better quality of leadership has come out of local government than out of national government through through this whole situation and the whole country owes you a debt of gratitude so thank you for that um, I'm, I'm really delighted to have been uh, invited here uh, to speak this morning I think it's our biggest ever conference it's the nature of being able to do it online is more people have been able to come and join us which is wonderful and I should congratulate our co-op councils on the work you've all been doing to support communities through uh, through this crisis the um during the lockdown you know all of the terrible things that were going on the infection rates the death rates all of it was absolutely appalling the damage to the economy to people's mental health and well-being but there were one or two things that 
we saw that we'd want to keep hold of. And from my conversations with constituents in, in, in my constituency in Croydon North, the thing that people really valued the, uh, through, through the lockdown was a sense of community, uh, of, of neighbourliness, of feeling part of a society. The mutual aid groups that flourished and allowed neighbours to come and talk to neighbours and help each other out. That is something that people want to keep hold of. And um, that, I think, is what is at the heart of the Cooperative Council's network. So when Keir Starmer, in his speech to the Labour Party conference, said, you know, we need to focus on the future and hear the sound of the future coming. I think we got a little glimpse of that uh, in the lockdown, that sense of community and wanting that, that, that feeling of belonging and neighbourliness back. Um, and that is what we do. That's what the Co-op Council's network does. So you are the sound of the future coming and please keep doing what you're doing because we can make a very big contribution for how we genuinely find a way to build back better after, after all this. Now, in, in, in my comments here, I just want to quickly have some reflections on what I think happened over the pandemic and why and how things have gone wrong at a national government level but then some reflections on the challenges that face all of us in national politics or local politics as we start to look towards the future and what that will be like and the contribution cooperative councils and our values and principles can make to that. So first of all I mean this was an unprecedented crisis Clearly, no government was going to get everything right, but the scale of failure uh, from, from our current government has, has genuinely been quite staggering. Their inability to learn from what's gone wrong and then correct it as we move forward has contributed to this second spike in infections coming earlier and looking much more severe than it needed to have been, and therefore the impact on the economy uh, and people's livelihoods more severe than it needed to have been. And for me, an absolute core of where they got things wrong was their constant uh, dogmatic intention to centralize and marketize everything they possibly could because it meant they got it wrong by ignoring expertise and insight from the front line in town halls and in communities they got it wrong on ppe distribution they got it wrong on expanding testing capacity they got it wrong on test and trace we still don't have uh, a properly functioning test and trace uh, system uh, in this country and that was a necessity if you're going to safely open up society and the economy. They got it wrong on shielding as well, all because they failed to listen to the expertise on the front line. So this, this, this crisis has brought so many existing problems into sharper focus and for me the total failure of centralisation is what has made our country uh, deliver one of the poorest responses uh, in the world to, to, what's, to what's gone on. Next problem has been the broken promises that local governments had to deal with coming from this government, particularly on funding. Uh, Robert Jenrick and Rishi Sunak, right at the beginning of the crisis, the Community Secretary and the, and the Chancellor, promised to fund, fund councils to do whatever's necessary to get the communities through this crisis. Then they just didn't. So, so what we're seeing now is councils having to make in-year cuts collectively in local government in England, that's worth three billion pounds, significant amount of cuts to make in year. But they're having to make them now because they are required by law to balance their budgets, to rein in spending to the level of resources that's available. The government's allowed this funding gap to grow. They promised to plug, but haven't. So councils are making cuts right now as we enter the second spike in infections, and as the economy slips into a recession that is showing every sign of being the worst, one of the worst for 300 years, that's not the time you want to be pulling back support from communities. That is a time when our communities will need even more support. So it makes no sense to me that the, uh, the government is doing this. Then, then we've had, again, during the crisis, the government talking about local government reorganisation. Now, I know there are there are discussions and disputes about this up and down the country, unitarization, taking away uh, local councils, reducing people's ability to have a say over what happens in their community. But it just makes no sense to me to do this. Um, if you're going to do it at all, why are they doing it now? You don't try to reorganize the fire brigade in the middle of a fire. And yet that's what the government's doing, potentially spending tens of millions of pounds on a local government reorganization that is not needed or required at this particular 
moment. And it's, uh, again, as in so much else of what they've done, it's a dereliction of their duty to keep the country safe and focus on getting us through the pandemic uh, and limiting the impact of the recession that is, uh, that is coming. Then a final point uh, in looking at what's gone on is the disproportionality in the rates of infection in different parts of the country. And just like the way that this, uh, this crisis has brought the failures of over-centralization into sharp relief, I think it's also brought into sharp relief the impact of inequality uh, in, our, in our society. We, we, this, this is a country that is scarred by deep divisions caused by inequality. And in this crisis, we've seen the communities that have been most affected have been the poorest communities. Very often that's uh, BME communities who are overrepresented in, uh, in communities that are living in poverty. But actually it is poverty in general that has been the problem here. People living in overcrowded housing with little outside space and therefore unable to self-isolate and prevent other family members, members from being infected. <coughs> uh, workers who are in low paid or contract jobs public facing jobs who couldn't afford to self-isolate when there was no support available to do that so they kept working keep getting themselves iller but also potentially spreading infections uh, elsewhere and then poverty related underlying health conditions that made some people not only more susceptible well, that made some people more susceptible to more severe effects once they were uh, once they got infected by COVID-19. All of that uh, a result of pre-existing uh, inequalities in our in our country and I you know it just seems to me that the absolute top issue that we need to tackle as a, society, as a society is how do we bridge those divides how do we reduce the levels of inequality that in this pandemic have led to some communities suffering more than others but more generally have led to so many communities being held back and so many of our fellow citizens being locked out of opportunities that ought to be ought to be available to them. Now, I just wanted to um, make a, a few reflections on what I think the, the Co-op Councils movement uh, is thinking about and the contribution we can make to genuinely trying to, to um, build back better. First is how do we tackle these inequalities uh, that divide our country? We can see the inequalities of health, wealth, education, uh, uh, and housing very, very starkly. But what we don't see so clearly is a deeper inequality that underlies those, and that is an inequality of power. Too much power is centralized in Whitehall, in the hands of national politicians who take decisions without fully understanding the impact on other parts of the country. We have to get power genuinely out of Whitehall so that decisions can be taken in the nations, in the regions, in the cities, and in the towns, uh, of our country, not the kind of fraudulent devolution this government is trying to impose, where, where really they're just trying to silence communities and weaken uh, communities' ability to be involved in meaningfully in decisions for themselves. Take what they're doing on planning, for instance, taking communities out of being able to have, have play a part in discussions about how their own neighbourhood is shaped. Um, a genuine devolution of power from, from, from Whitehall, but also going beyond just shifting power from one tier of politicians to another and putting real power in the hands of people in their communities, in the workplace uh, and over the public services that they use. <coughs> Co-op councils can show us many examples of tenants who have got a much bigger say over how their own homes are managed, including by electing tenant boards that the managers are, are accountable to. We've got examples of young people living in neighbourhoods that are blighted by high levels of unemployment and the high levels of violent youth crime, taking control of their own circumstances uh, in new decision-making mechanisms that give them, as the young people most at risk, and their families a bigger say in the support they need, not only to keep themselves safe, but to give themselves access to the opportunities that should be available to every young person in a country like ours. And older and disabled people, instead of just allocating people to services that we, that the service provider imagines they might want to use instead being empowered to choose the kind of services that they want to use models like self-directed care payments but pooled as collectives where their co combined purchasing power gives them more control over the kind of provision that they want to achieve the kind of lifestyle that they choose rather than is allocated for them so many ways that we can look at opening up power in this country 
not just getting it out of Whitehall, but actually opening up our town halls as well. So, so citizens can be, uh, can be in, the, in, in the lead. How do we fix the broken trust that is such a big feature of our politics at the moment? Well, I think the days when any politician could stand in front of, a, uh, of the country or a group of voters and say, trust me, I'm a politician, I've got all the answers, that is gone. People won't believe it. Things haven't worked out right for far too long for that to be the way that we go forwards. And for me, we have to invert that question. Instead of a politician asking people to trust me, we need politicians saying to people, I'm a politician, but I trust you to take decisions for yourself in the ways that I just outlined before. The, uh, whether that's tenants, young people, older and disabled people, community having a say over planning, we need to give people back the power to take decisions for themselves. And our objective becomes to win power, to give power away, so that we have a much deeper uh, form of democracy rewired around people, their families and their communities. <coughs> Excuse me. And the third point I wanted to make was about our political culture, because it's toxic, it's abusive, it's aggressive. The um, things happening in this country quite often follow uh, a short way behind what's happening in the United States. And if you saw the debate between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, for me, that really encapsulated just how aggressively macho uh, and unpleasant politics has come. We see it in social media, we see it in public discourse. And we really need to get away from a political culture that is all about winner takes all, defeating the other side, taking all power uh, for yourself. We've forgotten how to create the space to allow different people with different views to come together to negotiate for the common good, an outcome that will benefit everybody. And to understand that the quieter voices are just as deserving as a hearing of a hearing uh, as the louder voices. And I think a big part of making that shift is that we need to become much more respectful of those who we disagree with. Instead of simply dismissing uh, what it is that people are saying, we need to try to listen more carefully and understand the humanity uh, in what they're saying uh, as well. Now, for me, this is a fundamental shift that co-op councils are leading because social justice and co-production are two of the big themes that underlie what, what we're talking about in this, in this network, in this, in this movement. You cannot have co-production without different parties, different groups in a decision, respecting each other's uh, starting point. So for me, it's fundamental in the shift that we're, we're trying to bring about in politics uh, in this country. <coughs> now, I'll draw to a close now, but my, my, my final point was, was going to be this. I think that too often, all, all of our councils are involved in delivering public services. Far too often, councils have seen people as problems to be managed. We see them as uh, a collection of individual issues that we target different services on to try to sort them out. But when we do that, we don't fully respect the fact that each of those people is a fully rounded human being supported and sustained by the relationships that matter the most in their life, whether that's their family, whether that's their friends, whether that's their community. And by targeting support on them like a laser beam, we often neglect that pre-existing support that can actually give, not only help sustain an individual, but gives them a real sense of their place in their world, a, place, uh, a sense of belonging to, to, to the neighborhood that they are part of. We isolate rather than, than build a, a more relational form uh, of politics and support. And I think that is another key area where our network can uh, make a difference. Instead of seeing people as problems to be managed, we must recognize that People are fully rounded human beings who are cherished and nurtured by the relationships that matter in their lives, who have a sense of belonging to their, uh, to their place. And we re need to rebuild a new politics of cooperation around that insight, perhaps above all else. So in terms of bridging the divides of inequality that scar our country, we need not just a new politics, but a new political culture. I believe that is growing in the Cooperative Councils Network right now. But that politics of the future will be more cooperative, more compassionate, and I think, perhaps above all else, more respectful of the fact that we're all human beings and we all have loves and relationships and needs that reflect that basic humanity of who, who we are. And we need a new politics that can, that can reflect 
uh, and develop that. There you go. That's it from me. Thank you, Steve. Um, some very important uh, themes there that um, I'm sure you won't be surprised to learn have been reflected throughout our conference. And I do hope you'll have the opportunity to look at the um, the uh, ebook we've produced on on the COVID nineteen um, impact studies. Uh, uh, sorry, impact case studies that have been uh, produced by um, from many many of our councils. We've got twenty eight case studies in there. They're fantastic to see. And every one of those um, actually embodying uh, some of the things you've been talking about this morning about that relationship between councils and their citizens and you know, using the power of that citizen's voice to solve the current challenges that we have, because that's the only way we're going to get through this. There's no doubt about that. And um, I think your, your points uh, about inequalities are, are very well made. That's our theme for today. Uh, we are looking at the uh, the very disproportionate impact of uh, COVID between different communities, and there are some some startling issues emerging. Uh, in my own area, I serve on the community reassurance cell of the Hertfordshire Local Resilience Board, and um, we have been totally unable to get uh, thorough and accurate data for the impact of the COVID pandemic on our. Um, black and minority ethnic communities. That's not because anybody locally hasn't been uh, collecting that data. It's not collected nationally, and it's not. It is uh, it's, some of it is collected, but it's not collected reliably enough for us to determine what the impact on black and minority ethnic communities are in my county. That's not good enough, and you know we have to uh, we have to have a, a baseline of data to help us do our job properly. Um, so thank you for your words, powerful as ever um, in uh, crystallising uh, the value of our network and what it, um, what it delivers to our communities um, every day, uh, not just through the unprecedented times we've been going through. So um, I've got, um, uh, we've got a little bit of time for questions and the first one came in from Jeff Walker. Um, and Jeff is asking, and I know um, when you very first started thinking about Cooperative Councils Network, Steve, you were driven by some things that were happening to the young people in Lambeth. And Jeff's asking, you know, he's been thinking about health inequalities. Um, we, uh, in many of our communities, we see those. They, they are, we know the causes of them. They, they're usually driven by, uh, by smoking, by obesity, by um, uh, of substance abuse, whether that's alcohol or drugs, um, and uh, you know we're all trying to tackle them. But what Jeff's question is: How do we give young people a better start um, so that we don't get this uh, cyclical thing where these health inequalities go from generation to generation? Thanks, thanks, Sharon. Can you can you see me on the screen? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, you're. Yeah. I mean, I've yeah, allowed it, No, it's, it's, a, it's a really important, really important question. I, I think, I mean, one of the things I, I mean, none of the insights I have to offer are things that originated in my head is my starting point. I learned, I learned stuff from the communities I've been involved with as a, um, uh, as a politician. And one of the things I observed looking at violent youth crime when I was uh, leaving the council in Lambeth, but I see it where I am now in Croydon as well, is that the support we try to channel at young people who are most at risk of getting involved, which is generally young people living in conditions of extreme uh, poverty and social marginalisation, the support we target at them is not effective enough to stop the problem from happening. And when you give those communities themselves a much bigger say over how the resources are used, they will do dramatically more with the funding or resource uh, that's available than any outsider will do without taking their voices and their views into account. Now, models of co-production do this best because it gives the community who is on the receiving end of the service or the decision, the ability not just to assert voice, but to demand that it's heard because there's now a mechanism that they can use to get a hearing. So what we did where I was before, the council I was in before, we set up um, um, a, a community youth trust and shipped all of the council's funding uh, youth workers uh, and, and, and youth related, youth service related buildings into that trust with a board elected by young people from the neighbourhoods most likely to be affected by violent youth crime. And it was very, very successful. It cut violent youth crime by uh, a third in 18 months 
which given the scale of it at that point in, uh, in inner London was, was really quite dramatic. Now that's one intervention, but on its own, it's not enough. Uh, I think, I, think I, was, I was trying to hint at in my um, contribution earlier on, we need to stop just managing the problems in people's lives and work with them to prevent them from happening in the first place. And I'm very taken by the, you know, the movement around tackling adverse childhood experiences in children's life. It's, it's a disgraceful truth that for far too many of our citizens, their life chances are determined at the moment of birth by the circumstances of their birth. You know, if we don't tackle the trauma that can affect a growing baby or child's uh, ability, uh, cognitive ability, and ability to function, ability to feel um, safe and secure, then that child is much more likely to grow up experiencing all of the other forms of inequality that we see, educational disadvantage, uh, living in lower quality housing, health inequalities as well. So I think two things here for me uh, that are core. One, give the people on the receiving end a bigger say in the decisions that are going to affect their lives. And two, let's work with those communities to tackle the problems and inequalities that exist from birth so that we can give every every person, every child growing up in our community, uh, greater access to the opportunities that should, by rights, be available to everybody. Yeah, thank you. Um, and we, we did see some magnificent uh, prevention work done uh, through the Sure Start centres. Um, I know there are, there are still remnants of Sure Start around the country. I think it was a great shame that that wasn't um, uh, supported and, and kept going in the way that we all hoped it would be. We knew it was a long term project and it would take 15 years or more for the impact of those Sure Start centres to, um, to be demonstrated uh, in our communities. And um, in, you know, I, I, I have, a, we do a lot of work on domestic abuse in Stevenage. We've had this project called For Babies Sake, where we take um, young couples where either one or both of them uh, have had uh, domestic abuse history in the family and work with them from when, uh, during pregnancy and then up until the children are five years old. Uh, we've worked with over 25 families uh, in that project We've got um, academic analysis going on from that to see if we can stop the domestic abuse being a cyclical thing going from generation to generation. It's been a fabulous project to be involved with, but I think that just shows the power um, that there is scientific evidence even that um, that, that stressful environment that um, a lot of young people, too many of them grow up in, um, impacts on them right from uh, the fetus before the child is born and can uh, cause lasting damage. So I think we've got to think far more about um, the prevention side of this and, and early family intervention uh, as we go forward. It's a really interesting question you asked there, Jeff, and thank you very much for that. Uh, now, because of time, I don't, um, I don't uh, post to take any more questions, but uh, Steve is staying with us because he's going to chair our next plenary session. And so I just want to close this uh, opening uh, section with uh, a huge thank you to you, Steve. You've been a, a magnificent um, founder and champion of this network, and you now continue to be a great champion for local government. And uh, we um, we watch what you do uh, in the House of Commons with great interest. Um, challenging the government but also putting forward some very positive thoughts and ideas which is what we've always tried to do in the network we try and be very positive um, we call ourselves now the uh, the fastest growing network in local government which we think we are but we haven't got conclusive proof of that but we also say we're the friendliest network in local government and that goes to your points about being um, compassionate being respectful of each other um, making sure the political dialogue is challenging where it needs to be but with respect and um, is positive and looking to the future and how we how we resolve the differences we have and I, I always go back to Joe's wonderful words about there is more we all have more in common than that which divides us we're all humans we all live in communities we all live in families that's the thing that's that uh, binds us together we should always keep our eye on that uh, even when we're we're challenging each other uh, with the political debate so Thank you for your uh, wonderful keynote speech this morning and I'll hand over to you now to uh, chair and bring in some of our fabulous colleagues from Birmingham, Bassett Law, from Cardiff and from Kirklees. Thank you, thank you Steve for that keynote, very much appreciated. Thank you very, thank you very much Sharon. I'm really, really happy that you mentioned Sure Start because that of course was introduced by um, our very good friend Tessa Jowell who was one of my, certainly one of my inspirations in learning more about you know a, a human focused relational 
kinder form of uh, politics. And I, I think her work actually still inspires the work we're doing in this network today. So thank you for mentioning that. Right, now we're moving on to um, the plenary session, tackling inequalities uh, with COVID-19 recovery. Uh, and I'm delighted we've got a very illustrious panel uh, of four senior uh, local government figures. Um, we've got Councillor Sharon Thompson, who's a cabinet member for Homes and Neighbourhoods at Birmingham City Council, who have very recently joined the network um, and are now our, our, biggest, uh, our biggest single council in, in membership. Indeed, the biggest council, I think, in, in Europe. So uh, that, that's, we're delighted to have Birmingham in, in, in the team. We're, we've then got uh, Councillor Simon Greaves, who is the leader of Bassett Law District Council. We've got Councillor Pete Bradbury, who is a, uh, the cabinet member for Culture and Leisure at Cardiff City Council, long-standing members uh, of the network. And we've got Councillor Shabir Panda, who is the leader of Kirklees City Council. So a very illustrious panel. Um, you've heard more than enough from me, so I'm going to hand straight over uh, to, the, to the members of our panel. You've each got 10 minutes, please. Um, I'd be very grateful if you would come in at no longer than 10 minutes so there's enough time for questions. Uh, I'll go first of all to Sharon Thompson from Birmingham. Thank you very much Stephen. It's great to be a part of the network as the largest authority in Europe. We're very proud to be a part and thank you for inviting me to talk today about, I'm going to talk about from the homelessness work that we've done in Birmingham throughout the pandemic. Now, I think my starting point really is going to be we've all heard and probably most of us have said that things cannot go back to the way they were after COVID. And um, that's something that we've all said across the country, I think. Um, and the pandemic has highlighted long-standing inequalities and laid bare the gaps created by a decade of public sector spending cuts that we've all suffered from. So when the government talks about the need to build back better, for me, I'm a bit cynical, so the question, is it a catchy slogan or are we genuinely interested writing some of the wrongs of the last decade and one area for me for us to have that test is the commitment to positive change when it comes to homelessness because um, the responses that we give as a country to homelessness is a political decision and we've seen that before but actually um, the individual issues that people have we can support them as they go through that but we need to make sure that we're properly resourcing it as a country and taking it seriously and I'm not just talking about the sleeping, which is a common perception. I'm talking about the full range of homelessness that impacts and devastates so many lives and changes it for so many people. And as somebody that was a homeless teenager living within Birmingham and having lived through housing sector services and now come out the other side and working on policy, I know how important it is to listen to the voices of those that have been through such experiences as, as I would call them experts by experience. But just to give some background on Birmingham. So Birmingham is a city of 1.1 million people and that means we have significant economic challenges in the current climate. We have 3,535 3, households in temporary accommodation and that includes 556 in bed and breakfast which is too much for me. And at the beginning of my journey in cabinet, we really aimed at reducing this figure, but the pandemic has really changed things over recent months. We reduced and sustained low levels of rust sleeping from 2002 to 2009, and then we saw a steady rise through austerity. Our rust sleeping count peaked at 91 in 2018, which we all found quite devastating in Birmingham. But together with our partners, we brought this down over the last year to 52 with a real strong programme around prevention. And we continued on that trajectory and then came the pandemic and the government called for everyone in on March the 26th. Now, considering that rough sleeping increased across the country from 2010 to 2017 by 167%, and then went down slightly to 141% at the moment. Um, I think it's really key that we say that um, it was very ambitious to say that we needed everyone in, in just a few days. But we rose to the challenge and we were given a few days and some of our national um, charities, they put some of their staff on furlough. So we had to really rely on collaboration with some of the smaller charities. So we closed the local night shelter, we secured accommodation for rough sleepers, 
and those at imminent risk of rust sleeping and people with no recourse to public funds. So we closed the night shelter, moved their residents and contracted their staff. We secured 70 rooms at the Holiday Inn. We established an emergency housing option service at Washington Court, which is one of our commission services. And we created a pathway for those with no recourse to public funds and secured support on a legal consortium to help. And most importantly, we listened to our groups of experts by experience to help us navigate what their needs were. The pandemic has been a challenge for everybody in local government and it's been incredibly fast pacing and difficult to navigate through. But I'm proud of the way the work in Birmingham with our partners um, to not only meet the immediate challenges around homelessness, but also to build on our work at this time of the crisis. And we took this as an opportunity to look at the live data of what was happening across homelessness to bring together some recommendations to the government of what we needed moving forward once we came out of the pandemic. Um, the beginning of the pandemic, there were real fears that homeless people were at risk of an outbreak in the homeless community and we're quite lucky across the country we didn't see that. But in Birmingham we made a conscious decision to not only bring people in as the government had directed us, but we were keen to put a programme together of how do we keep them in for good. And at one stage, we had rough sleeping down to single figures in the city. We provided accommodation and subsistence for over 158 people with no recourse to public funds and we're still working with 78 of those. We moved the people that moved into the Holiday Inn, 26 of them have since moved into flats with support. Seven of them are in long-term supported, um, supported housing. Four moved into emergency hostel. And the bit that makes me smile the most is that 10 of them, we worked with them very hard and managed to reunite them with their friends and family so they went home. Our housing options team dealt with 630 single homeless presentations between April and June, and that figure is well past 1,000 at the moment. So that really does highlight um, the significant challenges that we've all faced. And the economic impact of the pandemic, in particular rising unemployment, means that the demand will not reduce for any time soon. And after the last recession and 10 years of austerity resulted in homeless crisis across the country, we cannot allow a repeat of this when it comes after this pandemic. I always keep saying that the word recovery, I don't like to use it when it comes to homelessness because where we came from wasn't particularly a good space. We need to redesign the way we look at homelessness and the way that we support people. And that's why it's important about building back better. And of course, rough sleeping hasn't been an ended by everybody in, but we have learned a lot of lessons. And in Birmingham over the last six months, has seen us build on our work with um, over the last few years, because we've been really keen to look at prevention strategy. And we've continued to keep building on this with our partners. We have a very strong emphasis on in, of prevention. Because my true belief is that if you invest in crisis, you continue to get more crisis often. But if you invest in prevention, then prevention is what you get. We haven't yet quite um, convinced the government of this. And we rely on, on our colleagues in Westminster to keep pushing that argument forward. We stepped up our operational for single homelessness space. And we're not replacing our voluntary and community sector partners. partners but we're working more closely alongside them for better shared outcomes. And we're very clear on that. And I do feel that we're very lucky to have amazing partners in Birmingham and a real emphasis on collaborative working because that has to be key to absolutely everything we do with all our partners across the city, local people and our experts by experience who have lived through the pathways of homelessness and the housing market. We're working across the sector with partners through our Housing Birmingham Partnership and Financial Inclusion Partnership to manage risks associated with the lifting of the eviction ban and other support measures because that's causing a lot of concern at the moment. And through Birmingham Social Housing Partnership, we're working together to enable a formal shared commitment to prevent and relieve homelessness in the city. And again, working with experts by experience. So the government also have a commitment to end homelessness in 2024 and if they are serious about the commitment councils and their partner agencies will need to be properly fund funded throughout 
the pandemic and beyond, but they also need to look at the systemic issues within the government policies that have pushed people into crisis in the first place. And the last six months have been incredibly challenging, but the, comings ahead, the months ahead will be no easier. So yet we see the homelessness effects of homelessness, we anticipate it getting worse, but we're up for the challenge, but we absolutely need national to keep us on board with being on board with us over the winter to come and the pandemic far from being over we're facing the conclusion of everyone in and we're very concerned about those with no access to public recourse so i'll just end on saying our ambition is to help to prevent and for any further homelessness crisis in the coming months and years but we can only achieve this as local government with a commitment from national government to provide adequate financial support and policy changes, which is much needed to prevent people from falling into homelessness in the first place. And I'll end there, Chair. It's fantastic. Thank you very, very much for that, Sharon. It's, it's, that's a really good example of how our cooperative council is using compassion and collaboration to get people off the streets. So thank you very much for coming to share with us this morning the work that you're doing. Uh, in the great city of Birmingham. Right, our, our next uh, panellist is Councillor Simon Greaves, the leader of uh, Bassett Law District Council. Interestingly, one of the so-called uh, red wall areas. So it'd be interesting to hear from Bassett Law, what they've been doing, but also uh, I think how the government's so-called levelling up agenda uh, is, is, is operating in practice. Right, over to you, Simon. Well, well, thank you very much. Uh, the, the reality is it's, it's not working at all in practice. And I'd, I'd say there's a, a damn sight more to go on that front. Um, there, has, there is a, a presentation that I was able to send through and I'm hoping that the technology will work. Um, and so uh, I think that if it's all right, we'll be able to move. Yeah, that's, that's the territory. So uh, what I wanted to do was to try and capture uh, where things have been for us in, in Bassett Law, who we are, where we are at the moment, and, uh, and what we're working on uh, with, a, with a focus on COVID-19 and tackling inequalities along the way. If we could go to the move beyond myself, we'll, we'll get there. So this is where we are in the world. Um, the reason I did this is because one question I've always asked is, where is Bassett Law? Well, as you can see, we're we're certainly uh, in the East Midlands towards the north there. And uh, you'll also uh, note that we are quite a large geographical area. Um, and uh, on the right hand side, we have major conurbations, uh, Worksop, Retford, Harworth, and a fair number of uh, villages and a very large rural community. If we could move on uh, to the next slide. And this is the reality of what we have been based on in the past. Um, one of the most important strategic purposes of the area was in relation to uh, electricity generation. Uh, we have had some of the last uh, coal-fired power stations uh, in the country. Um, one of them, uh, Cotton, that's closed in more recent times, was able to power 3.7 million homes. Uh, in the country and all this has been coming to an end because move on to the the next uh, one because the reason why the the power stations were, were there is because this was there as well um, and with the river trenters uh, along the way um, so in reality these uh, these uh, uh, coal mines have long since gone uh, the last one being Harworth Colliery on the on the left to just move uh, to the next slide, please. Um, in terms of uh, the COVID-19, uh, well, the, the pandemic and the uh, local response, there's no doubt at all that our continued commitment to the, uh, uh, the community capacity, working with the CVS sector, working with our partners, quite frankly, we were able to join the dots up in order to ensure that everyone collectively pulled in the same direction. In other parts, I know that in other parts of the uh, 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 country, this wasn't possible. We defended our CVS during the days of austerity and it worked very well uh, for us. We'll just move on 
please, for a moment. And then just to the uh, next one as well, please. Um, the truth of the matter is that we are moving to a, a low carbon future. And so strategically, uh, we have, uh, uh, there is a significant challenge. It's all very well decarbonizing. Um, but as I've said in other forums, the strategy has to be more than simply turning these power generating facilities off. There's got to be additionality. We've, we have the network, we have this infrastructure, we have to use it for the good of the community and the nation. We'll just move on to the next. Uh, I think there's one slide that might have been missed there, but I'll, uh, sorry, go to the next one. In relation to workshop, what you'll, sorry, in relation to workshop in particular, that was the location of the former colliery. Uh, it now is a, a distribution, high tech distribution uh, facility, more jobs than when the place was in peak production. And you'll see that it's also powered by green energy, uh, a complete step change to what we had previously. And uh, this is the direction of travel that we want to go with. Um, Sherwood Forest runs uh, throughout Nottinghamshire. Most of it is still in Bassett Law. Um, and the reality is that whilst we've been tackling COVID-19, we've still been looking at the, uh, dealing with the aftermath of the recent flooding, which you'll see uh, on the next slide, um, that uh, you'll see the, the real consequences of climate change that we've been uh, struggling uh, with. Now, in terms of uh, tackling the inequalities of the area, I'll just move on to the next slide, please. The, the truth is that we've seen through the COVID-19 crisis an acceleration in a number of existing trends. Uh, we've seen uh, a real uh, difficulties uh, for people uh, to be able to access uh, support. Uh, we see in terms of the uh, job opportunities uh, for the future, there's real difficulties. We have some of the best schools in the country in Bassett Law. What we don't have are the job opportunities for those local students who basically do move out the area, uh, which is a great shame. We don't have the level of enterprise in this community that we need to see in order to benefit the local area and local people. We don't have the, uh, quite frankly, the, we, we, through the, uh, the green infrastructure, we want to rediscover that green infrastructure and we want to work in a way that moves to a carbon neutral future taking away, quite frankly, our dependence and reliance on coal and energy generation and use that infrastructure and that capacity for a carbon neutral future. Now, working with local people and with the support of local people, what we're really seeing on the ground is resilience within the community when it comes to matters of flooding in local areas, huge amount of resilience there. The opportunities for people to be able to be, uh, uh, to make those step changes themselves in terms of preparation, people looking, at, looking out for one another. Um, and what we're also seeing in terms of the uh, uh, skills and the tools that people need we're seeing a significant drawing together within the local community across local business, across the larger stakeholders, really going down to the uh, provider level as well. And everyone's pulling in the same direction. Now, I would, I feel that this, uh, this pandemic and this crisis has acted as an accelerant, as I've said. But what we're seeing is existing trends really coming into a very sharp focus. 
and everyone pulling in that same direction. Um, so just to just move on to the next slide, please. Um, we do recognize that one of the greatest inequalities that we have in Bassett Law is that of opportunity. And by securing uh, the right investment and working with the right partners, we're working in order to turn around what has been a historic lack of investment into the area, working with the private sector. And the truth of the matter is that in terms of the government's claimed commitment to levelling up, it simply isn't there. And we are being very much shortchanged and local people are being shortchanged. And I have to say that there's a lot of false promises uh, that are being trotted out. So when it comes to uh, uh, the area, it is on the ground, local people, local business, and us as uh, uh, in local government, working with those communities in order to help reshape them and to secure the investment that we need. Because otherwise, we're gonna to continue to have these hangups where we haven't got the investment that we need. Where are the opportunities for local children, local people, for future generations? And we have to fight tooth and nail for that. Now, I'm not precious about where the funding comes from, whether we look north or whether we look south. And that's always an interesting debate. But fundamentally, we're not gonna get out of this crisis without having the right chances and life chances for local people and future generations. And everyone respects that and everyone understands it. And that's what brings a community together. Thank you very much, Simon, making the very, very important point there that we can't look after people and give them a better future if we're not looking after the planet that we all, uh, we all live on in the first place. So thank you very much for those important lessons from, uh, from Bassett Law. Right, we're, we're moving across the country now to Wales, uh, the city of Cardiff, the capital uh, of Wales. We've got Councillor Pete Bradbury, a long-standing friend of the co-op uh, cooperative and co-op councils movement cabinet member for culture and, uh, and leisure pete over to you thank you Stephen. it's a real pleasure to um be taking part in this debate um that's chaired by yourself and uh, my, my congratulations to you on your well-deserved move into the shadow cabinet as shadow co um, communities and local government secretary and um, when uh, um right across the uk i know where um, local government here in wales is devolved but right across the uk we were really really pleased with that appointment um, I haven't got a PowerPoint display. I'm, I'm very much writing a lot, uh, written a lot of this um, um, contribution whilst listening to the other um, panelists today over the last couple of days because I really want to tackle head on the tackling inequalities with COVID-19 recovery by starting that by saying by trying to bust the myth that COVID-19 affects everybody equally. It doesn't. It doesn't in terms of healthcare, where the where the where it's well known that poorer people, in particular in my in, in Cardiff, that is definitely true. Poorer people who are more susceptible to the virus uh, are, are, are being hit harder um, because they've got pre-existing conditions, such as pre-respiratory conditions or conditions with heart disease and stuff that makes it more dangerous if you get the virus, and also economically because the jobs that have been lost due to the fact that um that we are in this pandemic and we're all taking um we're all now moving to a virtual world like last year we were in rochdale and that brilliant town hall there here we're in the white void as john oliver would describe it of my garage room um contributing via zoom the facts are that if you are employed in casual um, employment, if you are employed in, in the hospitality industry, if you're employed in culture and art sector even, you are most likely to live in, more, in, in those areas, in those poorer areas which are harder hit. So in both economic terms and, and health terms, this virus treats people from poorer backgrounds a lot harder 
than it than in those um, those more wealthier areas of society. And here in Cardiff, is it's the same. We have the Southern Arc. If you if you live in a world like mine, which is in the Southern Arc, of Cairo, you were, your life expectancy pre-pandemic was twenty years less than if you lived in the northern area of Cardiff, and that is a startling statistic and one that we've been trying to get to grips with here in not just in Cardiff but in Wales in general. Here in Wales, I'll, I'll, I'll remind you because we are a UK-wide network here in Wales, we do have a different gov kind of government trying to do different kinds of things during this pandemic. Wales' its track and trace system isn't privatised, it is run by Welsh government in, 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 in league with local government and is achieving 90% track and trace um, numbers for those who contract the virus. We have, we, we have a government that is working when it comes to local lockdowns here in Wales, consults and makes local government a partner in those decisions for, the, for, the, um, for uh, you know, making us a part of the decision. It made me, made me baffled really when, great, when I found out that members of parliament and councillors in Greater Manchester found out about their local lockdown through Twitter. That wouldn't happen here in Wales. Mark Drakeford and his team and Vaughan Geffen always ensure that we are part of equal, equally a part of the decision-making process. However, that doesn't mean that we're immune from, the, from decisions that are made in Whitehall and austerity has still very much been a part of the conversation here in Wales for the last 10 years. Um, we've had a bit of shielding from Welsh government and local government hasn't had the levels of cuts that have been made in England, but still, it's you know it is a it is a lasting effect of austerity here that we've got that we've had problems with youth services we've lost out on things such as um such stat, uh, non statutory services have gone the cultural sector has been hit quite hard because of the pressures around social services and stuff like that and you really feel it during this pandemic kids are now at home and they haven't got as much to do because they because they, and they, so they're therefore hanging around the streets. We've seen a, a rise in antisocial behaviour and crime, and that has been a real issue here in Wales, as I'm sure it has been elsewhere. We have we have had some positive consequences of the pandemic, like Sharon, who I thought gave a brilliant contribution in in the first um, as the first panelist. We have been able to tackle our long term homelessness issues. We also managed to eliminate street homelessness by hiring out hotels and that has concentrated minds here in Cardiff on how to deal with that um, that problem post the pandemic post the pandemic but the, the facts of the matter is we are a different kind of uh, of government here in Wales than we are in England a shocking statistic is that Mark Drakeford is the first minister here was not did couldn't get through to anybody um, in the prime minister's office for about three months um, despite leading um, uh, the, Welsh, the Welsh government. I think um, Scottish colleagues will have a similar experience up there, which has made life difficult for us. Um, but we've had our income guaranteed. The lost income that we lost here in Wales in terms of the cultural venues, leisure centres, things like that, have, we, are, we are getting that money back from the finance team in the, in the Welsh government. However, that relies on good black block grant funding coming through, through the Barnet formula from, from Westminster. So whereas Welsh Government have taken those decisions to help local government out through the pandemic to prepare us for when we get back to normal, whenever that is, um, that they, um, we're, really, we're really, how long that continues um, is all dependent on the budget settlement Welsh Government get from Rishi Sunak as part of the Barnet formula. So all of those factors mean that what, what goes on in England does have a lasting effect here in Wales. Um, I have to talk a bit about the future of the union because I feel obligated to as a Welsh member of the, and, the, and the vice chair of, it, of this network. Um, Boris Johnson uh, made a speech last week stating that, um, that he is... Um, a big supporter of the United Kingdom and he would fight for the United Kingdom and the history of Britain. Let me say as somebody who's Welsh and is a member of the um, and, and is a member of the Welsh Labour Party here and I, I know we're a non-political um, organisation but it's important to give you a context. 
the SNP and Plaid have got absolutely no bigger ally in breaking up the union than Boris Johnson. And things like not speaking to the first minister for three months, things like not providing proper aid to um, and proper equal status to um, Northern Ireland, Wales and Scotland, to England, are winding up the Welsh public and are winding up people who do not live in England. And we, and we are seeing an increase in, in people talking around about independence here in Wales from a number that was which was about 12 percent which is now in latest polls at 25 percent and that has a real profound effect on the subject we're talking about here tackling inequality because the reason why people are go looked in 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 bigger numbers to to the um to the to the threat of independence and the law of independence is because of the the distant nature of what the UK of the UK government, and because they seem to be one rule. For, there seems to be one rule for them and one rule for another. And it is not too political to say that Dominic um, Cummins's journey to Durham um, had it, will have will will be a, will be seen in hit by historians as potentially a, a lasting effect. Of what is go of of the future of the union? Because that people were turning around and saying, "Well, hang on, here we were uh, are looking at the first minister here and, and how he was living in his shed to shield to stay away from his wife, um, who who is could potentially vulnerable to COVID nineteen." Yet on the other side of of Office Dyke, um, Boris Johnson was travelling up to Durham, and don't any decision we take here in Wales on tackling inequality will I think will will have a lasting effect on the future of the United Kingdom and how Wales's relationship with the United Kingdom and goes forward. And it's not a debate that's, um, I think that is unique to us in Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland. I think there are real issues in the North of England from what, from what I, from people I speak to uh, um, where people see that the power is, is too, and, and the resource is spread too thinly in the southeast of England and needs to be distributed more widely to those communities that need it the most elsewhere in the country. Um, I, I, I've got 50 seconds left, so I, I, I'll, I'll end by saying um, we talk about compassion and respect um, and how this network, um, that this network liaises with, with um, its members is a, is, a, is, a, is a testament for me for how, the, how government should be done. Government, I agree with what Stephen said. We you should be looking at a bottom up solution, solutions that are community led to, that can that can help deliver um, greater prosperity. And I, I don't see that coming from Westminster and Whitehall. It worries me as somebody who is um, who who is a Welsh member because I think with the, it's had to tend in a two hundred year union potentially in a, into a very very difficult and choppy waters. And we must we must prevent that and play our part as a UK wide network in doing so. Thank you, Pete. That was an excellent contribution. A lot of really really important points. But um, I think your your observations there about power, where power lies, how people can access power to shape their own lives and their own communities and their own regions and their own country, fundamental to the new settlement that we're going to need to be exploring as a country if we are going to protect. Uh, the union, but also give people uh, better opportunities in the future than they've had up until now. Thank you very, very much for that view from uh, the, the capital of Wales. Right, now we're heading up to Yorkshire. Uh, Councillor Shabir Pandor, who is the leader of Kirklees Council. I think, Shabir, you've, you've posted you've had a few problems with your internet connection, so I hope it's fixed and working now because we're looking very much forward to hearing what you have to say. So over to you, Shabir. Uh, thank you, um, Steve. Uh, I didn't realise you were, you were a founder member of this uh, organisation. Learn from you every day. Um, hopefully, my my internet connection will stay stable. And uh, um, good morning, morning to, to everybody on the panel and Sharon. Um, tackling inequalities. Uh, listen to yourself and all the panelists. Uh, I think uh, mine's going to be a bit of a mix of uh, touching. Everything from national, probably international, uh, to, to local. The way, the way I see it is, is that there's three pandemics that are at the heart of what we're talking about in terms of inequalities. First is COVID 19, 
good to in everybody globally. We've got local solutions. The second pandemic is down feminism and phobia, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, all that. And the third pandemic, the, 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 the electronic virus, the social media, which also uh, links to uh, poverty, right? Poverty is a man-made pandemic, right? We can very easily stop it out. Right, okay, sorry about that. Um, uh, I've had okay, internet connections uh, all day. Right, okay. Um, firstly, good morning to you all. And uh, I didn't realise, Steve, that you were one of the founding members. Um, I learned from you every day. Uh, I was saying earlier on uh, that uh, in terms of the pandemic, um, in my view, there's the, the three pandemics that are... Um, causing the, 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 the big issue that we're talking about in, in terms of inequalities across the piece. Firstly, COVID-19, which is actually a, a global pandemic that's actually uh, affecting everybody in every single corner of the world. Uh, the, the second pandemic is, is around racism um, and, and, and phobia, be it Islamophobia or anti-Semitism or any other phobia, homophobia, which is actually completely devastating a lot of communities. And, and the third pandemic, which is a more about uh, social media um, and uh, uh, affects uh, poverty because poverty, I see that as a pandemic which is man-made and hopefully the st sort of stuff I talk about will we'll, we'll touch on uh, all the presentations uh, that have been made. Um, uh, just to give you some context, uh, uh, and I'm sure a lot of you yourself uh, know this, uh, uh, there's potentially one million jobs that are going to be lost uh, on the back of uh, COVID-19 as we um, you know, come out of furlough uh, next month. Uh, in West Yorkshire alone, there's 76,000 people that are furloughed. furloughed. Uh, and in total, there's uh, 120,000 people that are at risk of losing their jobs by the end of the month. Uh, in Care Fleas, uh, we've got around 18,000 people that are at risk of losing their jobs. Uh, and just under half of these are young people aged 18 to 24. Um, infection rates, uh, 30 a few weeks was high. Now 30 is a norm because our national average is around 50, uh, and we've seen uh, infection rates per 100,000, uh, you know, well in excess of 100, uh, in some cases 400. Uh, so, you know, there's something that the government ha ha has completely got wrong, which uh, I think Steve yourself uh, mentioned at the beginning. Um, but, but there are some positives in terms of what we've done in local government. I don't want to repeat uh, the stuff that has already been said in terms of how we've transformed services, how we've, we've used IT and digitalised our services and the great work of the voluntary community sector. Um, and uh, the way it's come together, especially in the early stages, uh, and this is what we want to build on to actually develop a, a stronger and, and more powerful resilient community and recovery. Um, one thing that uh, I keep on stressing to a lot of my councillors, especially the ones that are uh, on the same parties as uh, myself, is the, the uh, virus doesn't discriminate. Um, despite the government trying to cause divisions uh, very, very um, indirectly uh, on, on race, on religions, on, on, on northerners, on southerners, uh, uh, and, and now young people, you know, suddenly, you know, they're, they're focusing on young people. I don't think it does any, any good to anybody in terms of that, that, that new politics that we're talking about. Uh, the, the, the virus uh, affects folk that are vulnerable who live in poverty. Uh, and the kind of people that we're, we're, we're sort of like passionate in terms of providing a, a good service for. Um, and uh, also, depending on your socioeconomic background, um, it, it, it will affect you more uh, if you're actually uh, in, in the, in the uh, lower uh, um, quartile of, of poverty um, and, and where you live, your, your postcode. Um, so it's not a surprise that in West Yorkshire, Greater Manchester, the North East, North West, Midlands, and, and in a city of London areas, uh, are seeing uh, big uh, uh, rise in infections and, uh, uh, and and more disproportionate impact around people of BAME communities. You know, the, the figures are there, uh, and the data is actually now very startling. It's not hidden anymore. Um, Closing schools affects life chances, uh, and, and uh, again, it hits the most vulnerable and, and, the, the, and the folk that are on the margins of society, um, uh, who have already got underlying health conditions. Uh, uh, and, but this is nothing new. You know, we've been saying this for many, many years. Um, and uh, 
that's where, you, uh, as, as a leader, uh, I've actually started to focus on how we can highlight the issues that are coming up from COVID-19 and how, how how unequal this world is. So together, we need to understand better the barriers uh, that, that stand in the way of uh, people who we're trying to actually make a, a difference to. So, so in Chet Leeds, what we've been doing is working with our faith communities across all denominations and all denominations uh, to make sure that we tailor uh, health messaging. Uh, we produce a number of videos in a number of community languages because, uh, as you know, in, in diverse communities like there, you've got 30, 40 languages at, at, at least, uh, you know, because we, we live in a, a very diverse world, a diverse community. Uh, EU nationals, we've helped them promote uh, the EU settlement schemes uh, and uh, the apprenticeship scheme. When I became leader, I, I, I realised very early doors that we were paying them £3.50 or whatever the minimum amount was that, that the government set. And I immediately said, like, this is not good enough, you know, just because they're young people doesn't mean to say we pay them two pence. You know, uh, so we've uh, straight away increased the amount to the, the national minimum wage uh, on top of all the other stuff that we were doing for them. Uh, because, you know, young people deserve a, a, a good chance in life and, and a springboard to actually a, a, a proper future. Um, we've also had a number of drop-in sessions uh, uh, for uh, the, our most deprived uh, wards in Kirklees uh, to actually promote more women, uh, more young people, disabled, and, and people from, from BAME communities come forward uh, to make Kirklees Council the employer of choice. Um, and we've developed management programs for underrepresented groups in, in, in our council. Uh, and we've started a, a series of training around inequalities uh, and around uh, unconscious bias awareness training. Uh, modern day slavery motions they've passed in the council. We've passed a uh, climate emergency very soon after Bristol declared theirs. Uh, we've introduced maternity leave for councillors uh, because, you know, as councillors, you know, it, the only way we can actually promote a wider, diverse, uh, group of people coming forward, especially more women, is to make sure that you know we actually look after them, uh, you know, when when they go off maternity leave, uh, and on the back of that paternity leave as well. Um, so the past six months uh, have actually really tested the organisation um, and tested the partner organisations uh, where communities came, you know, stepped up uh, to support the wonderful work that we, uh, we've been talking about uh, uh, today, um, and that has actually saved lives. And, and in a lot of cases, it, it, it saved livelihoods and mental health has been a key feature in that, which is actually now uh, getting to the forefront of, of what we're trying to address. Um, what we must do is we must harness the spirit um, because the, the recovery must give people hope, a better future. Uh, and in case please, right, everybody has got to be an equal stakeholder. And this goes on to what Steve was talking about in terms of the inequality around power which I'll come on to uh, later on. Um, key thing is about improving life chances for our young people. When I became the leader, we were in uh, special measures. Our children's services was uh, completely inadequate. Um, and very, very early doors, I actually reversed the cuts that we made because that had an impact on the outcomes for children. Uh, we, so we put back 11 million quid. Uh, and just very recently, we, 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 we were uh, uh, announced to come out of special measures. So that, that's great news. And we are now well on the way to becoming a, an excellent, uh, good council uh, for our children's services. Uh, I, I really have got two minutes left and uh, I've got quite a few things to do. Uh, but what I'll do is I'll try and uh, focus on what we've done around Black Lives Matter. Because when, when, when George Floyd murder took place, uh, myself and Jackie, the chief executive, said, what, what, what we need to actually put in some really, really quick wins, quick measures. Uh, so we did that. Um, and on the back of that, we've actually redrafted our um, uh, inequality action plan. Uh, and the way we're doing that is through the consensus politics that Steve was talking about. So I've established a cross-party commission uh, that will ensure that if we ever do come out of power, which we could do, that that is a priority for the council. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's a Lib Dem that are in power or, or, or the Tories that are in power. You know, we need to make sure that the commitment goes through because we're not going to change this overnight. It's about hearts and minds and it's complete change in culture. Uh, it's our vision to make sure that it's not just an inclusive economy and, and inclusive growth is at the heart of what we do, but it's about equality to level up every single aspect of what, what we're talking about. Uh, it's not just about health, housing, jobs and, and skills. It's also about the inequalities where structures uh, and, and uh, organisation establishments actually operate. Um, and the consensus politics is, is, is the way forward. 
uh, we we are at the major crossroads, I think, uh, in the challenges we face in terms of uh, globally. You know, we we see right wing governments that are taking shape, that are impacting us at a local level. Uh, so this is actually a lot bigger than politics. It's about people and it's about neighbourhood and it's about communities. So uh, we need a plan, and the plan I've put in place is to actually put communities, place, and people at the heart, uh, and get them involved at a very early stage, but at the same time make sure that we keep all the political parties uh, together to drive this agenda forward. Uh, thanks, Steve. Ten minutes uh, isn't a long time, but I've tried to do some justice, but I'm happy to take questions. And I did not do in um, justice news this morning. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Shabir. I'm, I'm sorry about the technical glitches, but we, we, we heard what you said in the end, so that, that, that's <laughs> great. And um, it was really worth hearing as well. I'm really glad you, you focused on the need to have a, a plan, local ones and a, a, as well as national ones, to tackle structural inequality. And a very important reference there to unemployment with seven and a half million people on the furlough scheme and that coming to an end in a few weeks. Um, yeah, it's going to be very, very difficult for an awful lot of people uh, if and when they lose their jobs. And the Resolution Foundation just this week pointing to over one in 10 young people potentially ending up unemployed, which takes us back to levels not seen since the 1980s. And no one wants to write off a generation like happened under the, uh, under the Thatcher government back then. So thank you very much for those important points. Right. Yeah, thank you. We've got left uh, slightly under 10 minutes. I think about nine minutes and we have a question here from Chris Dabbs so I'm going to come around everybody and just give you if I can just a, a minute and a half to to response but what Chris says is what are the key lessons from COVID-19 for effective partnership working between local authorities uh, and voluntary cooperative and social enterprise organizations to tackle inequalities on a longer term basis it's a very very uh, big question and you're only going to have about 90 seconds each to respond so um Let's fly over to Birmingham first and Sharon. Thanks, Steve. And I think that's a, that's a really good question. I think the first lesson is just to get on with it. Um, we've learned that cutting through red tape and that communities will no longer wait for us. They will get on with stuff um, and, not, and will ultimately leave us behind if we don't keep up pace. Um, going on to the digital world as a workforce, you notice that we've managed to do that very quickly. I think shared resources and expertise from a co-located perspective, rather than that organisation does that and that organisation does that. And be really clear about the expertise, to trust, which sounds really basic, but actually that was a big thing that we picked up on. Um, and the flexibility, because we found that, you know, in, in communities where they had very strong um, community infrastructure, they didn't need us to come in with a centralised approach. It just did not work. It fitted in better when we came in and fitted in with them. In areas where they didn't have that infrastructure, they needed a little bit more of that centralised approach. So it was about being really flexible and fitting in with that. Um, and also, ultimately, it's OK to be vulnerable as a local authority. Community stepped up and they helped us to get on with the task to deliver to keep everybody safe. So I think I'll leave it there. Well, thanks, Sharon. That, that, that was very, very concise, but incredible insights there, packed into your a couple of minutes. Thank you so much. Simon, up in Bassett Law. Um, well, I think, first of all, um, it helped immensely to have a, a good, solid track record of engagement with the local CVS sector and the different agencies on different organisations on the ground that are, are integral to being able to step up to the plate and tackle this problem together we no one went into this with sharp elbows saying we're the ones that are in charge here we certainly didn't approach it that way uh, mutual respect and understanding uh, we all bring different skill sets and capacity to the problem and together that jigsaw worked very well for <coughs> us. and so um, We've had a, a good track record of that engagement and working together cooperatively in the past. And when this crisis struck, everyone pulled in the same direction. But that's because we had the, the, the groundwork there to start with. Um, what we see now with the, the way that this uh, virus is, is progressing is that those relationships have continued, that work has continued, and 
it's quite obvious that everyone's going to have to tack in a certain direction. But you have that long-standing uh, 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 recent history um, and everyone understands what needs to be done. And when you're going into that together with a clear understanding, then that helps immensely. Thanks, Simon. Uh, Peter, how are you using partnerships in Cardiff to tackle inequality? Well, the, um, the facts um, that we've got out the way of many of the social enterprises and just give it and have given them what they, they've asked for and what they needed. I think what Sharon just made, made the point as and I backed up by Simon was, you know, it wasn't about the council swooping in and make and um, kept riding to the rescue. It was more we've got these people they are willing to do something. Um, and in, in terms of in terms of Cardiff, a lot of them are long standing relationships with social enterprises that we've had agreements with over the years. So we know what their strengths and their weaknesses are. And we've just been able to minimize their weaknesses and, and help them give them the tools to, to deliver the stuff that they wanted to, that they're, and they're able to deliver. Um, we've had enough challenges, frankly, administering like grants for small businesses and things like that. We've concentrated on the things that we can actually help in getting those things out, that economic support to SMEs and, of a bit and things like that whilst help and using the mutual aid groups and the social enterprise groups on the ground to help us in ensuring that communities are getting what they need and that, so i my what i've said is get when you when local government can, uh, can facilitate great but if you if their social enterprise is there that can do what we can uh, do and you can concentrate on the bit on the things that you need to do in terms of getting financial support to smes and things like that get on with that and, and just support those smes that's really helpful. Thank you very much. And um, finally, Shabir in Kirklees, back on the phone, I suspect. Uh, thanks. Yes, I'm on the phone. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, a really good question, a very big question. Uh, first, you need a plan. One thing that's um, come very, very clear that the government doesn't have a plan. Uh, so uh, let's say we were in charge of more stuff. What we would do, we would be planning for uh, going back six months, we'd be planning for the half-term break, we'd be planning for exams, we'd be planning for kids going to school, we'd be planning for six weeks holidays, we'd be planning for, you know, um, people, uh, you know, coming to eat to, to all, all the religious festivals. And, and, and now there's still a time to actually plan, you know, in terms of Christmas, New Year. Uh, and one thing that the government hasn't done is, is, is actually taken this uh, pandemic very, very seriously and, and they've, 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 well, they've made U-turn after U-turn. It's not a political point, it, it's reality. Um, what people don't like is stop start, you know, because at the moment you can do that, you can't do that and, and it just confuses the whole situation. Uh, what we did to actually manage the situation was very, very early doors. We increased the ward budget for councillors, because councillors are at the heart of their communities, they know their communities. Uh, uh, to uh, another, another 40,000 on top of the 30,000 they got. So each ward got 70,000 in total. And we left it to them to spend the money uh, and, and said that you will be accountable in public how you spend the money. Uh, and, and, and that actually boosted them because they know their local voluntary community sector and we allow the creativity to take place uh, and, and trust and, and that joined working and, and tra transformation I was talking about, that allowed that to actually springboard and come in and take its own life. Where government guidance was uh, short, uh, community stepped up uh, with our councillors, uh, and in a lot of cases, uh, yeah, a lot of folks put themselves up uh, in front of harm's way. Um, and, and from a leadership point of view, what I began to do was to actually open up doors with opposition parties to actually get this consensus politics that we were talking about. Because what I didn't want, I, mean, I made it very, very clear that I do not, do not want to make this issue into a political issue. And I think that message was so very, very powerful. Um, and that's why, uh, you know, the feedback I've got is we've done, we've done okay. Um, and humility is very, very important. You know, you, you can't afford to be in a mature position uh, when, when people want that direction. You know, they want strong leadership. At the same time, they want, they want compassion and humility um, and, and uh, make the best out of the worst situation. Uh, but it's unfortunate that, we have a government that, that actually hasn't really got a clear plan. And again, this is not a political point. Even the, the backbench Tories are actually saying that keep us involved, you know, keep us in the loop. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, 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 that's uh, 
it's that that's what my take is on and, and how, how how we've learnt lessons over the last uh, six months or so. Brilliant. Thank you, Shabir. Right, we've got we've got until eleven thirty three, so we've got about two and a half minutes uh, left. So I'm going to fill it by asking each of you to give me one thing you want the government to change or do differently to help you serve your communities better. One thing that they need to change. Top priority off the top of your head. Um, Sharon. Oh, Steve, that's a big question. It's like a wish list with me. Just um, one. <laughs> um, I think it would have to be to fund local government properly. I think one that we like one of our key wish lists is um, we're going to be massively affected if they don't give us the money that we deserve. And um, the resilience has been stripped out of the country through the cuts over the last decade anyway. So I think absolutely it would be funding would be one of the top ten. One thing to do differently. Brilliant. Thank you. And I'm going to try and see if we can not get repetition. So even if the other panellists, if your issue is funding, please think of your next one down. Over to Simon. Um, I'll say certainty, consistency and some accurate data, please. That's a really good one. Data. They've not been sharing it, have they? And then this is nope. taken. Really good one. Thank you. Uh, Pete in Cardiff. Well, you know that one of my best mates in politics is Kevin Brennan, Steve, and I'm going to follow his lead and Stephen Doughty's lead in what they've been saying about the cultural and art sector that plays such massive roles in our communities and is a huge part of the UK's life. You know, properly, you know, treat them like you would any other industry and give them the financial the support so they can get through this difficult time. You don't realise what you've lost until it's gone. And I do believe that this sector, Steve, is, an, is, on, the, is on the brink of, um, of, of, real, of a real fundamental crisis, which will end up on local government's doorstep as well as central government in, as, as well. That's such an important point. This country would not be this country without its arts and uh, its arts sector. Thank you very much for that. And finally, Shabir. Uh, give hope to uh, the folk that we, we are here to serve. I don't think th th there's hope um, being, being shown, especially as we go through the next two months uh, where up to a million people could actually become unemployed. And a lot of them are, are going to be young people. Yeah, that's critical. Well, I mean, thanks everybody. This has been such a great panel. Some amazing uh, insights there into how we build back better and tackle inequality after we come through this unprecedented COVID-19 crisis. Thanks to all of you on our panel for the work you're doing in leading our communities forwards through all of this. You know, I, I genuinely believe, given the failures we've had from national government, it's local government that's got us through this. And it's cooperative councils in local government that are pioneering with new approaches that genuinely will allow us to build back better. I hope you've enjoyed the session as much as I have. Uh, wherever you're sitting in your offices or your, your rooms at home, please give them a gentle ripple of applause and I'll hand back to our chair, Sharon Taylor. Thank you so much, Steve, and to, those, for the, uh, to all the contributors to that uh, plenary. Uh, some fabulous insight there um, and uh, some real um, insightful uh, comments about what we need to do for the future uh, and going forward and I'm you know I think it's our cooperative values that have kept us going through these difficult times and will um, inform and uh, help us to go navigate the next difficult stage of recovery. Huge thank you to you Steve um, for being with us and giving us so much of your time uh, this morning. It's always a pleasure to um, have you uh, when you maintain your interest so clearly in the network and we're very grateful for all your input uh, and your ongoing support for what we're doing in the Cooperative Councils Network. So thank you for that. Um, of course, um, colleagues, we should have been in lovely Shropshire this week in Telford and um, we were all looking forward to visiting our friends in Telford. Uh, sadly, uh, the pandemic's got in the way of, uh, of us all traveling there but um, our next session uh, looking forward to 2020 and that's our next task is to how uh, look at how we go forward for the future is um, going to be led by uh, councillor carolyn healy carolyn is the cabinet member for visitor economy historic and natural environment and climate change for telford and Rekin council um, I'm delighted to welcome her here today to, even if it's virtually, Carolyn, 
uh, wave the Telford and Shropshire flag for us this morning. So uh, we look forward to hearing from you uh, and from lovely Telford. Thank you very much. Um, and, and, and for what it's worth, I echo the, the four asks that were outlined in the, in the previous session, as I think we all do. Um, of course, I think on the agenda, it should have been um, the leader of the council, Sean Davies, speaking to you now. So uh, Sean has asked that I pass on his apologies, and he is very much looking forward to welcoming you to Telford next year. Um, obviously, as a cooperative council, our cooperative principles are our core to everything that we do in Telford and to our vision uh, to protect, care and invest to create a, re a better borough. Um, as many of you have been describing, this year has been a year of, of huge challenges. Um, but, but like for you, our, our cooperative principles and values have been called cool how we've responded. Um, first to the, the worst flooding in Ironbridge that we've seen for, for around 20 years, and then the COVID-19 pandemic, which came pretty much on the heels of that flooding. Um, throughout that, we, we work with our partners, local people, and ensuring that the most vulnerable in our community were, were cared for and, and, and protected. Um, you know, and our, our cooperative approach has meant that we're building that resilient community as outlined earlier in the week by my colleague, Ray Evans. Uh, so, you know, COVID is still with us, uh, but we are determined to make um, a better borough rather than going back to normal. We want to go forward into a new normal that's better for our communities and kinder to the environment. Um, and as, as you said, Sharon, my cabinet areas of responsibility include the natural environment and climate change. It's something I'm very passionate about. Um, like other councils, we've declared a climate emergency and committed that our organisation will be carbon neutral by, by 2030. And we set an aspiration for the borough to also be carbon neutral by the same date. Um, we are a, a forward thinking council and we've actually got a good track record in this. Um, in the last nine years, we've already halved our carbon footprint through things like converting all of our streetlights to LED um, and also investing in our own solar farm. We were one of the first councils to do so. Um, so we are looking also at, at, at more green energy schemes um, and we'll, when you come next year, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to share some of those with you. Whilst our borough is, is centred around the new town of Telford, we are actually a very green borough. The original concept for the new town was actually to be a forest city. And we're continuing to take that, that vision forward, not, not to create a city. Our, our housing targets are actually much lower than the original new town plans, although people still get upset at house building, because I'm sure they do everywhere. Um, but we do want to be a forest community and we're enshr enshrining that in our local plan so that, you know, that, that kind of green network that runs through the town and connects the countryside parts of our borough into the town centre is very much part of what we're about and ensuring that those spaces are accessible as well. Um, we have an awful lot of woodland um, right into the centre of town, as well as uh, really valuable grasslands and wetlands. And we're managing all of these areas so that we can sequester more carbon, but at the same time enhance biodiversity and making those open spaces better places to visit, both for local residents and, and for tourists. Now, I've mentioned tourism and Telford might not be the first place you think of when you think of visiting a tourist destination, um, but I would say you really should. Tourism is actually a really important part of our local economy. Um, we have in Telford the International Centre, which is a, a large conferencing venue that pre-COVID brought many business visitors to the area. Um, I think we've got a really good location in that we're very close to um, the, the, the West Midland Urban conurbation, but we're also, we've got the Shropshire countryside as well. So we've kind of got the best of both worlds on Telford and that, I think that's what attracts people. Clearly the business tourism sector has taken a beating recently and it's, it's unclear what sort of, when that activity can re resume. But we also have the Ambridge Gorge World Heritage Site, which brings in over a million visitors a year. Um, and we've redeveloped our town centre offer to connect the town to our award-winning town park, which runs right into the centre of the town. Um, and despite COVID, our visitor numbers are, have stayed really good actually. And we're finding that we're benefiting from a staycation effect, not just local people discovering the local area, which they have been, uh, but visitors, from within the UK who don't want to risk going abroad. Um, so we want to capture that and build on that in the coming years. Um, and so we continue to invest in our destination and also our festivals and events. I think in the last workshop culture was mentioned and, and we don't see culture as a nice to have. We see it as an integral part of what makes a thriving community. Um, 
obviously this year we've had to do things in very creative ways so we've had things like a secret hot air balloon launches instead of our usual balloon fiesta um, and poor old Tom Jones is having to wait until next year to, to perform but we've done lots of virtual events as well. We are an ambitious council um, and for a small council I think we often punch above our weight um, and I'd say that's evidenced in, in some of our recent um, inspections so we're, we're outstanding for children's services um, and, and uh, the Care, Care Quality Commission have also judged us outstanding um, in aspects of our adult social care. So in 2021, when you visit us, we want to share more, more widely our story of Telford, what we've sought to deliver, what we've achieved to make Telford a great place to live, work and visit. Um, I'm going to sh show you a short video now that shows some of the great things that are happening in Telford year on year. lovely seeing crowds of people and people actually dancing and touching hopefully we'll get back to that um, fairly soon but as I said at the end um, you know, that's, that's a, a bit of a slice of, of some of the things that are going on in Telford um, but obviously when you come to see us next year um, we'll, we'll tell you a lot, a lot more about what we're up to um, and I and my cabinet colleagues will look forward to meeting you face to face in 2021 um, and showing you more that, of our wonderful borough so thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's uh, an amazing insight, Carolyn. Um, I love the film. Um, hopefully you're going to tell us a little bit about that beautiful uh, uh, artwork, that statue, the angel one. Uh, can you tell us any more about that? The Knife Angel, it's been doing a tour, so we in, in actually in Shropshire, so just a little bit outside of our borough, um, is the, the British um, uh, Steelworks and they have, um, they make these wonderful steel sculptures and it was a, a local local lad that actually designed that um, and it has been in various other places around the UK but we were really pleased to secure it for Telford um, of course raising the issues of knife, knife crime and whilst we are a beautiful borough we have areas of affluence we also have areas with with some social issues uh, including issues of knife crime and some of our um, you know new town is our older new town estate so it was important that we we got that not just because it's a beautiful structure but also because of the educational program that came with that to work with our young people sadly curtailed because of lockdown <laughs> we didn't get to do all of the things we wanted to do um but but yeah it's, it's now back home in oswestry so um hopefully we could perhaps um bring it back because we didn't get to get the full benefit of it this time it's a stunning image as were many of the images on that film thank you and from one new town to another yeah. you know new towns often get some pretty bad press but 
the um, incredible vision of that post-war government to create these wonderful places, and I've grown up in mine, uh, and I feel very passionate about it, but um, have uh, a beautiful uh, built environment, lovely natural environment, and all of them have developed this amazing sense of community spirit that, um, that characterises our new towns uh, across the UK. And, uh, you know, it's, it's lovely to uh, make this connection with another one of our new towns. So uh, we look very much look forward to visiting you uh, when we get round to uh, our conference in 2021. And we'll keep everything crossed that we are able to travel uh, to Telford um, next year and, and all meet there in person. So thank you for virtually hosting uh, our conference this year, Carolyn, um, and uh, good luck with all the things that are going on. And let's hope that um, the winter is kind to you in Shropshire and you don't suffer from the, uh, the, uh, the, the terrible flooding and so on that you had last year. I know some of our other councils uh, were in the same situation uh, last year. So let's hope that um, the, the weather is at least kind to us uh, for this uh, winter and autumn. Thank you so much, Carolyn, really appreciate that. So um, it falls to me now to um, close our conference, although I hope um, most of you will join us for the AGM meeting, which is at 12.30 uh, today. Uh, but what a fabulous um, three days of conference we've had. And I think it's very important, um, looking at all the work that's been done in our councils, through COVID, through the rest of the year, um, that as we build back from this terrible crisis that's hit our country and all of our communities and all the individuals within our communities, that we ensure we don't turn the clock back um, to the inequalities, to the sidelining of community that we sometimes saw, to the needless uh, and reckless treatment of our environment, um, and to the shift of power um, away from those affected by decision making. I hope that when we, as we build back, we can build back with the spirit of all the things that, that we do, building back um, with, uh, for our environment, with localism, with compassion, with community, all words that have come shining out of this conference for me, uh, and with hope uh, for the future. And with that spirit of cooperation, that guiding spirit that uh, is there for all of us as we work uh, towards the future. And I do want to say um, a few thank yous. Uh, first of all, a big thank you to our keynote speakers, to Jonathan Reynolds and to Steve Reed, um, great friends of, of our cooperative network. And we're very grateful to them for their time uh, for our conference this week. To all the councillors, officers and affiliate members who have participated, all the councils have contributed to our case studies pack um, uh, and, on, uh, and our uh, COVID-19 case studies. Uh, and on that last one, an amazing achievement to produce that in such a short space of time. So uh, I know that took a huge effort on behalf of all those involved, both those producing the case studies and those pulling the ebook together. So um, a huge thank you to all of the people that worked on that. And please keep sending your case studies in because that's what is the great strength of our network is hearing from councils, the diverse way they tackle our challenges, uh, the way that you respond to the needs of your community inspires us all. So please keep sending those in. Thank you very much to our executive members um, they do a wonderful job all year round uh, supporting the network and our, our values and principles uh, board members who are there to keep us on the straight and narrow with uh, all things cooperative, particularly to Chris Pemberthy, our wonderful chair of, of values and principles, who gives, um, gives me such great support in uh, managing uh, the work of the network. To our tech team, now um, I've had uh, a number of virtual conferences in the, last, uh, in the last few weeks and I can honestly say, and I don't say this lightly, uh, the tech on our conference has been managed uh, superbly well um, and with um, you know, almost no glitches, it's gone really, really smoothly. That's down to the fantastic team of people at the Cooperative College and Chris Meadows who has been uh, supporting Nicola and I as we've pulled all this together so huge thank you to all of you this is a new world for us all and um, 
you know, it's it's difficult to imagine uh, if we'd been sitting in, in uh, Rochdale a year ago to imagine that we would have had to do this this way this year. Um, it's presented a, a huge number of challenges, but you've overcome those this week and helped us to deliver a, an amazing conference. And thank you to the officer team who give the network such commitment and dedication to Jonathan Downs from Oldham and of course um, the absolutely wonderful and unique Nicola Huckabee uh, without ho whom literally nothing would get done in this network. She uh, has the energy and the drive and the passion for cooperation uh, that um, helps us keep everything going. So um, I'm really grateful to all of you for attending. It's our councils, our members, our affiliates um, and our associate members that, that absolutely make this network uh, what it is. And um, when we get to our AGM, we will be going through some of the many achievements that we've had, even in this most difficult of years. I'm really, really proud uh, of what we, what we do in this network. I'm really proud um, and delighted to see how the network's growing. It's growing in size, but it's also growing in the influence that it has and you know a number of the policy areas that we um, we have been championing for years are now uh, finding their moment and really uh, pushing forward and influencing even in some unexpected places not not always the political spaces we we would expect them to succeed that's fantastic news uh, for cooperation but most important it's fantastic news for all the people we represent because we uh, champion their their needs and their involvement and their engagement uh, in the uh, in the policies and, and activities that we do so um, a huge thank you uh, I'm going to uh, close conference in enough to give everybody enough time to go off and uh, have a cup of tea before we get to our AGM but please do join us uh, for the AGM um, and we'll um, we'll just go through uh, some of the many achievements the network has made during the year. Thank you to everyone who's taken time out of their very busy diaries to uh, attend this conference and I look forward to seeing you again at 12.30 uh, and to hearing from all of you uh, during the year with your uh, case studies of what's happening in your area and the more you can tell us about how you're driving recovery um, the better the recovery will be across the network because we all learn from each other so um, thank you so much everybody and uh, we'll see you all again in just a little while thank you